All right, well, good morning. morning. It's great to see you guys this morning. If you have your copy of God's Word, I would encourage you to turn your Bibles to Song of Solomon chapter 8. I thought last week was going to be the last week we we looked at Song of Solomon, but why not run it back one more time and talk about parenting? Because that is exactly how Song of Solomon ends here this morning together. We've been looking at this book for um, nine weeks now about God's wisdom for love and relationships. And, and there's an important relationship that Song of Solomon addresses that we just can't overlook yet, and it's about parenting. And so um, this morning we're looking at chapter 8, and here's what I want to point out to us before we get started, that here in Song of Solomon, that the book of Song of Solomon is really talking about how to, how to raise a daughter, here, here at the end of chapter 8. Now, a lot of this carries over on how to raise boys, how to raise a son as well. But this is specifically talking about how to raise a daughter. And I think that's super helpful because whether you have a young girl a, a, as a child of your own or you have a young boy who will marry a young lady at some point in his life, this is so important because, because I believe that our world would be a lot better off if, if, if godly men who had to had love, honor, and cherish uh, the daughters of, king, of, the king, of, of, of the king. I think that, honestly, if in my estimation, a lot of people say, well, raising a daughter is a lot harder than raising a son. But I, but I ultimately believe that it comes down to loving them, pointing them to Jesus, and ultimately teaching them, showing them how to love one another. And, uh, and I believe that this morning that that starts with parenting God's way. The Lord has a plan and a purpose for us in how we parent our kids. And I want you to understand that the Bible says that p- being a parent is a high and holy calling. Psalm 127 says, Blessed are, is the man whose quiver is full of children. So children are a heritage from God. So so with that mindset that children are a blessing, not a burden, we can then see that God has a purpose, that God is going to grow you as an adult. God is going to grow, use you to transform the, and guide the life of your children. And today we're talking about how to raise a daughter and a son, but especially a little girl. And, and we'll see how impactful that is for all of us, uh, I believe, when we dive in. So if you'll stand with me. Song of Solomon chapter 8, we'll read verses 8 and 9, and we'll, ju- and we'll pray. This is the last, this is the conclusion of this entire book, and what a journey it has been together. Verse 8, we have a little sister, and she has no breasts. What shall we do for our sister on the day when she is spoken for? If she is a wall, we will build on her a battlement of silver. But if she is a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for your word. We're thankful that you have given us wisdom. You have spoken to every area of our lives because you know them all. You care for them all. And God, I pray that your word would not just inform us, though I pray it would do that, God, I pray that it would transform us, that we would see how valuable we are in your sight, and Lord, that we would love and appreciate, honor and cherish one another as as spouses, as parents, as children, and Lord, that we would be reminded that your love influences and impacts our love. So God, help us this morning, and we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So when Haley and I were expecting our baby uh, last year, less than a year ago, uh, we went to do an ultrasound. And less than a year ago, we went to do this ultrasound, and I had two thoughts running in my mind. Two thoughts. Number one, I really was praying for a boy. Okay? I was praying, and I was sure of it. I was like, God, you have already shown up. I know that this is going to be a boy. I was, all the old wives' tales about heartburn and, high, and like a high heart rate and all this stuff, I was like, here we go. We're about to have another, another little Dustin right here, okay? And I was praying for a boy. However, 
second thought coming through my mind before the ultrasound, because we knew before everybody else knew, okay? So the second thought was, is I wanted a boy, I was like, I'm praying for a boy, and I knew it was a girl, okay? Lead, months leading in, I thought it was a boy. The more we got closer to the ultrasound, I was like, I don't know. So I stopped Haley in the parking lot. We're at UT Hospital in the parking lot. I looked over at her. We're about, we haven't walked in yet. I looked over. I said, hey, and it's, it's late at night because we have a friend there uh, who, who hooked us up. And so I was like, I was like, we need to embrace the reality that we're about to be told that our baby is a girl, okay? I said, and I said, I said go ahead, and I said, I, 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 didn't, I didn't see cloud formations in the sky. I didn't hear a voice from heaven. I was like, but I just have a gut feeling that I have been praying for a boy so much that God, with his sense of humor, is going to give us a girl. And so I said, let's, let's go ahead and get ready. So we walk in, again, late in the hospital. The moment arrives, our friend is there, and she, she's like got the, like this magic wand thing and like all this goop and whatnot. And she's like, you want to know? And I'm like, yeah, we want to know. And I was like, it's killing us. It's like, yes, I want to know. And she said, okay, are you sure? I said, yes, I'm sure. Just tell me, you know. And so and she was like, well, congratulations. It's a girl. And I, I was standing there, and, and, he, and he looked at me, and I looked at her, and I was like, we're going to be okay. I was like, I think, I think. We're, I was like, are you sure it's a girl? He's like, no, we're sure it's a girl. I said, no, are you really sure you don't see anything else in this ultrasound that would indicate a boy? Are you sure? She's like, no, I'm pretty positive it's a girl. And I said, okay. I said, okay. And so I, I had all this anxiety rise up in my body because I didn't know my daughter yet. And I also, it's like, how do you raise a girl? Like, I, like, having been a boy, I know I have a pretty good grasp on how to raise a boy, okay? My dad kind of smacked us around a little bit, got us in line. We survived. We're okay, okay? Like, that's, you know, you're just trying to keep your, your, your son alive from doing, from like self-inflicted stupid stuff. So I was like, that sounds pretty easy. So, but how do you raise a daughter? So I began to pray. I was like, Lord, we're going to need you right now. I said, okay, I said, Lord, I need you right now because I don't know what we're doing, and yet I know this is your plan for my life, your plan for Haley's life, your plan for our life is that it is good and better for us to have a little girl. Like, that's your plan for us. Your plan's better than my plan. You don't make mistakes. I know this is going to be, this is going to be good for us. And so on August 17th, 2022, Little Nora was born and everything changed, okay? Now, some births are like weeping and gnashing of teeth. Ladies, some of you all know, okay? It's like the back end of a horror movie, okay? And then other ones, uh, other, other times, it's pretty, it's pretty smooth, pretty simple, straightforward, okay? That was ours. And then the moment comes you get to hold your baby for the first time. Now, when I held Nora for the first time, it's like my heart exploded in love. And I had two thoughts in this moment. I'm holding her, and I thought, I would die for you. And my second thought was, I would make a whole lot of other people die for you too. Okay? I, I mean, I mean, like, I, will, I love you so much, I would give my life to protect you, and I will make sure other people give theirs as well if they mess with you. I was like, I am, and my heart, it's kind of like the Grinch, right? The, the Grinch's heart grew three sizes, right? That was, that was how I felt in that moment, that, that, that this little girl who's almost a year old, it's crazy August, right? It's outrageous how fast they grow up. Uh, it's, it, she is like the joy and the light of our, of our lives. She's almost a year old, and my love for her continues to grow. People said, people were trying, trying to prep me. Oh, man, when, it, when it's your own kid, you won't, you know, you won't, there's not words to experience. You see other kids, and they're like snotty nose, and they don't behave, and you're like, okay. And, you know, but when it's your own kid, like, you just, you just embrace it, right? Like, like, you love it, like, like, you love your own children in a way you can't describe. And that's so very true. And, 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 that, and I think that's because our love for our children is inexhaustible because, because the resource of love is inexhaustible, that God is love. He is infinite. 
And so because of that, the love we have for our kids is a different kind of love. The love you have for your spouse is a covenantal commitment love. Hey, I'm in with you, you're in with me, and we're, we're, we're going to work through it thick and thin till death do us part. But the love you have for your kids, I mean, it's just a, it's just a different kind of love that's hard to quantify. And what I couldn't help was think is, man, if I love my baby like this, how much more does God love us? His love is perfect. And all of my imperfect love, I love her. And yet God loves us even more so. And I look at Nora, and she's so smart and strong and talkative. And I'm amazed at all the little things she does, by the way, since I'm her daddy and I'm up here. Um, this past week, she, was, she stands up on her own, which is like not a big deal because she's been doing it for a couple months now. She just stands up, right? And so, but she like, Haley was on the side of like this, play, play, uh, this playpen thing. We call it the fort, okay? And she was like, you know, trying to get Nora to take some baby steps. And Nora just like, she's 10 and a half months. Nora just like took these like two baby shuffles. And it's like my heart was so overjoyed and my heart was so sad at the same time. Right, because now it's like trying to hold her is like wrestling a bear, okay? And so it's like, you know, you're so, you, you just love your kids. It's, it's a high and holy calling. God's put my life and Haley's life to be her parents. And if you have children, it's a high and holy calling for you to be parents as well. Because here's what I know, that, that we are raising our kids. Even if your kids are grown, your kids are 20, 25, 30, doesn't matter. Even if your kids are grown, your kids are living in a war zone. That our culture, our culture is doing what it can to strip the dignity and, and to add confusion and to destroy everything good and godly that God would have in store for your kids. We live in a world that is not conducive to this wholesome, uh, carefree upbringing, that, that life is a war zone. And your job, even though your kids may be grown, and like, and, and like for those of us with little small children, our job is to lead, pr provide, and protect for our kids, okay? And so every night, I, I'm thinking about, again, leading, providing, protecting, all aiming towards Jesus. Every night, I pray, I whisper, because Nora doesn't stay still long enough if she's fighting sleep for me to actually uh, pray a long time. But every night, I whisper a little prayer uh, in her ear, and I pray that, that she would always know the love of Jesus every day of her life. And I pray that God would protect her and she grew up smart and strong, and I pray that God would use her life to make an impact in her generation. I pray that, I, like 15 seconds, I pray that right there and, and, and with her, in her little ear, uh, just so she will, just so I hope that as she gets older, she knows that, that she has been prayed for and cared for and that we are trying to do our best to point her to Jesus. So fundamentally, what I want to do this morning is I want to remind you how valuable you are. You're valuable to God. Uh, you're valuable to your kids. You're valuable, you're valuable to your spouse. You, you are needed. You are necessary. Uh, God has a purpose for your life, that God is working in your life, whether you have biological children or not, that you are, you are making, you are a difference maker in somebody's life. And so I think all of this is for us, that Jesus shows us how valuable we are in that while we were lost in sin, Jesus gave his life, shedding his perfect blood on the cross for us so we could have new life with God, forgiveness of sin, so, so that there is, there is grace, God loves you, God is using your children, your spouse, your family, God is using the people around you to grow you and grow them. That's what I want you to know. And so we're going to jump right on in here. Jump right on in here. So what we see here beginning in verse 8 is that parents use God-given authority to lead children towards Christ. You're like, man, Dustin, give me a big picture of what it means to be a parent. This is it. Big picture of why you're the parent of your children is because God has, has given them to you so you will steward your resources, your spiritual gifts, your life, your walk of faith that God has, has, has given you all of those things so that you will lead them towards Jesus. That's it. Is it so I can provide for them and, uh, uh, and fulfill all of their hopes and wishes? 
If you can, awesome. But your number one responsibility is to use your role as a parent to shepherd your kids towards Jesus Christ. That's your job. And so here, we pick, we pick this up in verse 8. So here are her brothers, Solomon's wife. This is flashing back to when she was a, do- a little girl. You're going, Dustin, why are, we, why are we talking about little girls and how to raise a daughter, though it applies to, to raising sons? Why are we talking about how to raise a daughter? Because they're flashing back to when Solomon's wife is a little girl. Okay, She's reminiscing. She's an older lady now. She's looking back on her childhood. Okay, And this is, her brothers are talking to her. Or they're talking here. Verse 8, we have a little sister and she has no breasts. What shall we do for our sister on the day when she is spoken for? Now, this is not about her anatomy. This is about her age. She's probably 9, 10, 11 years old. Okay, she's really young here. And they ask what we can do for our sister. In other words, dad may not be in the picture. You don't see, she does not reference her dad, her father at all in the entire book. She references her mother and her brothers, but not her father, okay? And so her, her brothers are the authority figure in her life. They are the men that are going to guide her and protect her and provide for her and work for her and show her what responsibility looks like, okay? And so they've got to lead and protect her. And her, and her brothers ask, what shall we do for her on the day she is spoken for? In other words, on the day that we give her away uh, to her groom, on the day that she gets married. So we're raising her up. We're the authority figure. We are leading her, and then one day we'll be handing her off, and she'll start her own family. What will we, what, what will we do up until that point? What will we say at that point? You see, parents... I know you're trying to survive today, okay? But it's helpful to remember the big picture. That we're not just thinking about today, we're thinking about the big picture for the life of your kids. Because as a parent, especially as a dad of of little girls, if you have a little girl and you're a dad, you've got to think about the day you will walk your little girl down the aisle and and you got to parent and, and lead her Towards that day, I'm going to give you some perspective of how fast life will happen. From the time that your babies are, are born until they're 18 years old, legal adults, you have 940 weekends. That's all you got. You have 940 weekends. You have 940 Saturdays to watch ball games. You have 940 Sundays to bring them to church and raise them in the Lord before they're adults. You have 940 weekends, and then they're on their own. I was doing the math. Nora is already, we've already, we already had 46 weekends with her. We're down below 900. We're in the 890s now. And my heart broke about that a little bit because the days seem long, but man, the months are short. I mean, that time, that, that, that time thing doesn't stop, does it? I told Haley, I, we're, we're, we were at a, an event last weekend at a, at a, uh, for a, a dear family member and friend, and um, I was talking with some other people who were there, and we were talking about our kids, and their, and their kids are in high school, and one of their kids, is she's a freshman in college, and, and we're talking about Nora, and, and I just said, you know, if I, could, if I had like a magic remote, I'd want to hit the pause button and just stop where she's at right now. You know, every stage, it's, it's kind of like that. I want, I, want, I want to go, oh my gosh, she's done something new. I want, if I could just stop time right now and always be this young and her always be this little, I would love it. And, and they were telling me, they said, it's amazing, though, but as you grow with them as they get older, every stage, it, you, you feel that way. You want to stop. You're like, you're like, man, now that, now that they're able to uh, be a little bit more responsible and you're enjoying that, you, you want to stop it there. Then, they're able, then they become more of like an adult and, and, and they're, a little, they're much more independent. You stop it there because it frees you up a little bit. And so, and so it's interesting. You have 940 weekends, 940 weeks with your babies. And think about it, if your kids are, if your kid is, if you have a, a child that's 10 years old, nine years old, you have, you, have le- you have less than 450 weekends. Isn't that crazy? 
how fast life goes. And I get it. When you got little babies, you got little kids, you feel like you're, like you're in baby jail. You're, trying to get, you're just trying to wake up in the morning and then get your kids back in bed in the evening, right? You're just trying, you're just trying to survive, right? And but I want to encourage us, hey, take advantage of, what, of, of, of the situation God's put you in because God has given you your kids, so leverage all the resources you have. Seize the opportunity because now is the time. Now is the time to lead them and love them and teach them and invest in them. Because one day, after 940 weeks, they're they're, they're making their own decisions. They can move out of the house. I mean, they're getting their, they got their own jobs. They got their own responsibilities. They're going off to college. And so now is the time. And so her brothers think about her future. And they're, and they're not willing to give her what she wants, but instead they give her what she needs in order for her to become all that God has in store for her. Because guys, there are, there is, dads, there is coming a day when your kids get married and, 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 and they start their own families. That are like, especially if you have a daughter and you walk her down the aisle, you will, you will literally and figuratively take her arm out from underneath your arm and you will hand her hand over to the man that she's starting her family with. 940 weeks. Time is of the essence. And, God, and you want to be sure that, God, that you have used your God-given authority to love and lead and show her the way towards Jesus and set the example for her so she can become the godly woman that God's made her to be. And, and parents of boys, same thing is for you. You're, you're, trying to, you're trying to make sure that your boys grow up to become men. Not just young, immature males, but men who are responsible, who are, who, are, who are mature enough to handle and treat a woman right the way God would have her be treated. And so, in fact, I heard a story from a pastor who did this wedding. And uh, this dad, who's a real tough guy, is walking his daughter down the aisle. And his daughter is the youngest of his three kids, and she is the only girl. So two older brothers, youngest child's a daughter, big tough guy, he's walking her down the aisle, and he's crying like a baby, kind of got, like, like sucking that lip in, you know, trying, to, trying not for it not to quiver, you know, and he's walking her down the aisle, and they get to the front, and the pastor asks the, the dad, who gives this woman to be married to this man? The dad looks over at the groom, looks back up at the pastor, and he says, her mother and I do. And then the dad leans in to give the groom a hug. Okay, but his free hand, so he reaches in like this, his free hand reaches in his open jacket pocket and pulls out a 357 Magnum bullet. Okay? And and so, and but their backs, they're hugging each other. He, like he's leaned into his son-in-law, and and but like their backs are to the people, and nobody, everybody's like, oh my gosh, it's so sweet. He's hugging him and praise, praying for his son, his future son-in-law, and it's awesome. We're so happy. I want a moment, right? So, there, so everybody's crying, you know, it's so sweet. And so he leans in and he gives, he has a 357 Magnum bullet, okay? And the dad leans in and he says, boy. This is a 357 Magnum made right here in the United States of America. It stands for honor. It stands for integrity. And if you don't treat my daughter the way she deserves to be treated, the next ones are coming at you a lot faster. <laughs> Unhinges the arm, kisses the daughter, and walks back to sit with mama. Right? And I thought, man, you know what, that, you know what kind of dad that is? That's a dad leveraging his God-given authority to lead, provide, and protect his baby girl. I thought, praise God. I'm going to write that down. I'm going to use that later, okay? I said, I might have to do that when Nora gets a little older, okay? And so, so ultimately, though, ultimately, her brother's authority, they're directing her life. She makes decisions, yeah, but she's a kid. They're put, they are putting her on the right path because it's direction, not your intention, that determines your destination. It's like a golf swing. You can try to hit it straight all day long, but if, you don't, if you're not aimed in the right direction, it's going right or left. Your intentions are great, but it's the, it's the pattern and the direction that you set that will determine where the arrival is. Okay? And so here's the clause they give her in verse 9. If she is a wall, 
our older brothers. If she is a wall, we will build her on an embattlement of silver. But if she is a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. In other words, they are, are going to protect her and they're going to play the role that God has given them to play in her life to prepare her to meet the man that's going to marry her. Not an immature boy, not, because the difference between a boy and a man is a boy takes, takes, takes. But a real man is a man who's ready to love a woman like Jesus loves us and lay down his life for her. That's real, that's real manhood. Real men don't take, real men give. And her brothers say if she's a wall, meaning if she's trusting God, if she's, if she's patient, if she's pure, if she's mature, if she's ready for adult life, if she is waiting on God to provide, not chasing after shallow, frivolous relationships, but if she's waiting on God to provide for her the person she should marry, if she's being patient, then we will, we will throw for her a wedding like she's never seen. But if she's the door, and she's letting all these little immature boys into her life, then we will step in and make sure to act on her behalf to safeguard her from heartbreak and from misusing herself. Because marriage is serious. It's lifelong, it's, it's glorifying to God. Sex is for married people. Ta did a whole sermon on this, okay? Adulthood means responsibility. And so, so they're saying, listen, when you become an adult, you can then make decisions. And if you want to mess up your life, you can mess it up as an adult. But while we are in charge, you will not mess up your life while we're here. What are they doing? Leveraging God-given authority to lead, provide, and protect their baby sister. So I want you to remember back in chapter 1. She talks about her brothers. And in fact, she's so upset at them because of how they are leading her that she, that 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 <laughs> that she doesn't call them her brothers she says my mother's sons were mad at me you know how it's like you get mad at your parents you're like all right bob like you don't call him dad all right bob you know and it's like hey that's still your daddy son you know what i mean so it's like but she's so upset at them she's so frustrated at them so she calls them her her mother's sons well, they won't let me have a, all my friends have phones and they won't let me have a phone. And so you know what? I don't, I, I don't like them. They have social media. They have TikTok and Instagram. I don't have TikTok or Instagram. I can't believe how they're treating me, right? So she's upset at them because they make her have a job. They make her work. She's out, she's out, out in the vineyard working. She has, a, she has a farmer's tan. She doesn't like it, okay? Her brothers loved her enough to teach her and give her some responsibility for her to mature and grow, even though she didn't like it. And what's amazing is, is even though she didn't like it, she still submitted to their authority. Because it's easy to submit. It's easy to go along when you like what's being said or done. You know, like everybody loves Jesus when Jesus happens to agree with them on a situation. But man, when Jesus, when, when the word confronts me or challenges me, doesn't line up, it makes me change because, it, because God won't change, oh, then, then, then me and God have problems. You see, it's easy to submit when, everyone, when everyone's agreeing with you. It's easy to go along to get along. But, but, when you're, but when you're faced with something you disagree with from a parent, from an authority figure, boss, um, uh, I think about even... God forbid, our government. There are authority figures in life. In the church, we have a hierarchy of authority, right? We have pastors and elders that make decisions and that lead. So it, 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 it's one thing to say, yeah, I'm cool with everything as long as it, it agrees with me. It's, it's real true submission. It requires real true humility when you say, you know what? I don't like this, but I'm going to go along anyway. That's different. When God says, hey, you know what? No, you can't, you can't go about life the way you've been doing it. It takes real humility and submission to say, okay, Lord, not my way, but your way. That's real submission. And so here they're un she's under their authority, but we're all under authority like that. We all are. And so it takes humility here. And so her brothers don't give her what she wants. They give her what she needs. 
because they love her. Here's the nature of love, especially from an authority figure as a parent to a child, is that, is that there's always a, a manner of, there's always a manner of, like, uh, this dichotomy of encouragement and correction. And you need, to have, you need to have a balance of both. Because you can discipline without love. You just grow up in a very harsh and, and hateful household. But, but, the better way, and, and, and what's true is that you cannot love without discipline. You can love and discipline, or you can just discipline. And so, so when it comes to leveraging your authority in your children following you, we really want to be sure that we're striking the balance of making sure our kids know they are loved even though they don't like what's going on. So as a child here, she receives this authority. She says in verse 10, I was a wall and my breasts were like towers, meaning she's grown up now. Then I was in his eyes as one who finds peace. Her brothers say, man, if, you, if, you, if, if you're patient, you're trusting God, you're waiting for God to, 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 to provide for you the, the spouse he has for you, if, if you're not pursuing these flippant relationships, then life will go well. And she says, I was a wall. And she grows up into maturity. And she finds peace. That word for peace in Hebrew means is the word shalom. By the way, the name version of the word shalom is Solomon. So she finds Solomon. She finds peace here. And so what she says here, here is, is I thought I, 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 what I thought was pain and punishment was actually loving provision and protection, preparation. She was a peasant working in a field, and yet God was working behind the scenes. And even though she didn't like it, she continued to submit to the authority figures in her life that, that God was working and preparing her for this marriage with Solomon. Okay? Verse 11. Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Haman, and he let out the vineyard to, to, uh, to the keepers. Each one was to bring uh, for its fruit a thousand pieces of silver. So the keepers are her brothers. So God brings her brothers, pr providentially brings her brothers to this garden, to this vineyard. They're like, hey, yeah, we'll pay the lease. We'll, we'll farm it. And as they farm that thing, eventually the, the sister grows up, meets Solomon, and they wind up getting married and having this beautiful love story that we've had in the Song of Solomon. It's amazing how if we wait upon God, God always comes through in his timing, the way that he knows is best. And so God was developing her character. Look at verse, look at verse 12. My vineyard, my very own is before you, O Solomon. O Solomon, you may have the, the thousand and the keepers, the fruit of 200. So again, they're getting her ready. They're setting her on the trajectory her brothers are for this new relationship. Guys, children need authority figures in their life, okay? Parents, coaches, teachers, bosses, church leaders, grandparents. They're, they're, they, children need direction because they, because they don't know what they're doing. And parents, that's you primarily. You are necessary. You matter that you set the tone and the trajectory for your kids. And so for the kids and the youth that may be in here this morning, I know that you don't want to listen to your parents right now because you look at your parents, they can't operate their phone very well. Their flashlight is always on. And they wear Crocs with socks, and you think that's really uncool, even though it's very comfortable. And, and hey, function over fashion, baby. So, so... You look and you go, man, that they're pretty tech illiterate and they dress like a goofball and I'm not sure they, they're even in touch with reality. They don't know how the world works anymore. Look at them. Your kid, parents, your kids think this about you, okay? And so, and so, kids, I know you feel that way about your parents, but let me say this. Nobody loves you like they love you. Nobody cares for you the way they care for you. Nobody knows you like they know you. And nobody is for you like they're for you. Parents, you are for, you love and care. You are for your kids. And kids, teenagers, your, your parents, your authority figures in your life do love you. And so let me get, so parents, let me give you some goals here for your children. 
I put these in your notes here, and I think they're so important. You, you're like, man, okay, I want, I want, we, as a Christian, I don't just want a, I don't want just well-behaved, socially adjusted, normal kids. My goals are more specific than that because I think the Bible is more specific than that. And so here are some goals here. The first goal for your children is that your kids would be holy. And what, I, and what I mean by that is, is that that word holy means set apart. It means distinct. It means different from. So in sin, our good deeds don't do anything to save us. We are not holy in an, it, because we're sinners. That we need to know Jesus Christ by faith as Lord and Savior. And so he died and rose again to pay for sin, to establish a relationship with God, and to, and to redirect the trajectory of our life towards life with him in eternity. And so, and because of that saving faith, God looks upon you, you trust him, God takes you, and God sets you apart from this world, apart from sin, apart from death, apart from all of the, all of the, the cultural norms that are acceptable, that you are, you are made different in Jesus because you've been washed in, the, in his blood. And so because of that, God, is, God has said, I've taken you out of a kingdom of darkness and I've brought you into a kingdom of light. Your life is different now. I want that for my daughter. And I believe that every Christian parent will want that for their kids too, holy. Second would be humble. That, that learning to submit to authority, even when you disagree, because the truth is, is that, is that, that your kids will be pr praying they come to know Jesus, that they'll submit to the Lord, they'll have teachers, coaches, uh, they'll have other authority figures like bosses that they'll have to submit to. And so, and so, and so here, humility is a great, it, it, it's, the Bible puts a high premium on, on humility. In fact, it's so high that God says that to the proud, that he humbles the proud, that God opposes the humble, or opposes the, the proud, and he draws near to the humble. And so, and so humility is a, great, it's a, it's a great biblical goal for your kids, hardworking, creating gratitude, not entitlement. And, and another one would be is, is having an attractive character having an inner beauty, having an inner maturity. Because if you parent your kids only towards the external, they'll eventually be disappointed. Why? Because, because the external has two enemies, time and gravity. Right? Hey, things are going to change on you as you get older. Right? If you're only caring about the superficial and the shallow and the physical, then, then you're missing the deeper heart work God, is, God has placed you in their life for. And so... And so the Bible talks about the difference between focusing on the external and focusing on the, on the, on the internal. Because let's be honest, you know, you, you reach 40, right? There are some days you need like an Advil smoothie to make it through Tuesday, okay? I mean, you just, I mean, you just need some help, right? And so, so the Bible says this about people who only care about external things. Proverbs eleven twenty two, 22. Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman without discretion. Imagine finding a 24-karat gold ring in the, in the nose of a muddy, nasty, wallowing pig. And you look at that and you go, man, what a waste of a fine piece of jewelry. That, 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 that is because you're missing that God doesn't see like man sees. God sees the inner person. God sees your heart. God wants your heart. Not, not just behavior modification. That, that, that your life will change if your heart changes by the gospel, by the grace of God. Which is why Proverbs 31 says, her children rise up and call her blessed, and her husband also praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Holy, hardworking, humble, and having an inner beauty and in character. Those are great goals for your kids. Those are great biblical goals for your kids. So I want you to look at how the book ends. Verse 13. Oh, you who dwell in the gardens. This is Solomon speaking to her. 
O oh, you who dwell in the gardens with companions, listen for, listening for your voice, let me hear it. So they're old, and he still wants to hear her. He still wants her to be near to him. Verse 14, and, and then she responds, Make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. Now listen, you are well-versed in, in the Song of Solomon enough to know what mountains of spices are. They're older. They're still connecting, okay? So I want you to think about this here. This is, this is the end of their love story. And just, just note, fellas, that in the Song of Solomon, she talks first, she talks last, and she talks most, okay? And that's true for a lot of our marriages. And you guys aren't saying anything, but that's because you know it's true, all right? Because you know you'll get, that, you'll get that strong elbow in the rib cage here in a few minutes. And what, but what she's saying here is what she's saying is this is our version of happily ever after. You know, happily ever after doesn't happen by luck. It, ta it takes trust in God. It takes hard work and nurturing the garden. Marriage is referred to as a garden in the Song of Solomon. You can't, you can't neglect a garden and it produce fruit. You have to nurture it. You have to work at it. And you have to be patient and let God uh, bring about the growth. And so as we close this series in the Song of Solomon, I want to give to you, I want to speak to three groups of people here. I want to sp First, I want to talk to moms and dads, especially dads, okay? I want to give you four tips that I believe are super biblical, four things you can do to raise your kids, especially if you have a daughter. So girl dads, this is especially for you because I'm a girl dad, and uh, but it applies to everybody. Number one, point them to Jesus. Point them to Jesus. Dads, you need to do this for your daughters and for your sons. You've got to point them to Jesus all the time. Get you, we have them back here in, our, in the kids' check-in area. We have Jesus storybook Bibles. It doesn't matter how old your kids are. I would, I would take one of those. If you need one, we'll give you one. And you can read that because every page, it connects all of these Bible stories, all these Bible events to Jesus for children. And I would encourage you to always be pointing your kids towards Jesus. Pray out loud for your kids. I looked up a stat this past week, and I, I, again, I love stats because I think they're super helpful to, to kind of get a, a picture of things. Did you know that your child has a zero, follow me, zero point zero six percent of becoming a professional athlete? Less, less Less, way less than 1% of going pro in a sport. But it's 100% guaranteed that your kids will stand before Jesus one day. And I feel like a lot of times, I, 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 you know, I, I, coach ba I coach youth basketball for a long time after I, after I stopped playing basketball, and you see parents living vicariously through your kids, and, and it's like your parents are trying, to, trying to compete. Now, I'm for sports, but sports are not forever. And there's a whole lot of time and energy and money and effort put into sports or even focusing on where your kids will spend their four years in college. And, and, we, and, and it's easy to neglect where they're going to spend forever in eternity. Because the reality is, as parents, you are the primary disciple maker of your kids. You are the primary teacher of your children. You are the, the first authority figure in their life that they see and they hear and they respond to. And so and what we do as a church is we come alongside of you to supplement and help you. What we do as a church is we take a softball and we put it on a tee and we provide ministries and teaching and, and adults who are loving and praying for your kids and we put that, that spiritual softball on a tee and we're simply helping you hit the softball. That we're, we're, we don't replace you, but we're coming alongside of to encourage you and equip you and strengthen you and cheer you on. And sometimes I hear, I, I hear things like this. I heard, when I was a youth pastor, oh, when I was a youth pastor, I, um, I heard things like this. You know, my kid doesn't want to do this or my teenager doesn't want to do this. Hey, time out a second. Aren't you the boss? 
Aren't you the parent? Aren't you the one leading your, aren't you leading your home? Hey, listen, your kids don't want to brush their teeth either. But you don't let them go a week without brushing their teeth because it'll rot their teeth out. So you, you get them to do things that they don't want to do because they need to do it. You're spiritually investing in the future of your children. It's like, well, my kids don't want to. Okay, awesome. I don't want to go to work on Monday morning. I mean, are we, I mean, what's, what's the difference? That, that as parents, you have a golden opportunity to lay the foundation because when they're 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, that they're going to be gone. And, and you can't, you can't, you won't be able to sit there and monitor their life, but you can establish it now. You can establish that now. It's a big softball that we're providing. And our ministries at Freedom are not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but we're gonna pray and we're gonna read the Bible and we're gonna make much of Jesus and we're gonna, we're gonna surround your kids and your youth with loving adults who have, the, who have their best in mind and who wanna point them to Christ. And I would, I, would, or I, would just push, I would just say this to you as well, that there is no other place other than if you're leading in your household, there's no other place that, that, is, that is more focused on Jesus than, than, than a church. It takes a church to raise a child, not a village. A church Amen. to raise a child. Yes. And so, because one day, sooner than later, your kids may not, may not talk to you about stuff. But they need to know there are adults and there's a place they can go and there are people who love them they can talk to. Listen, I have aced Hebrew and Greek in seminary. Aced it. Right? And I know that even though, even though, I will tell one day, I will tell Nora, hey, this is what the Lord has, this is what Jesus would do, this is what God would have us do, and she's not going to listen to me, but she'll go to Miss Heather or Timothy, and, she will, and she'll be like, you know what, they're actually right, I should actually do this, and I'm going to be like, are you serious? Like, I told you that too, right? Hey, but that's why it takes a church. It takes a church. I leverage my authority, and then there are other people around praying, loving, leading towards Christ. Point your kids toward Jesus. Point your teenagers toward Jesus. Leverage every available resource towards Jesus. That's why we talk about serving in kids and in youth ministry a lot. It's because you, that's a way to make a great spiritual impact for the next generation for Christ. Point your kids toward Jesus, especially dads. Oh, this is good, too. Number two, I think they're all good. That's why, I put, that's, why I'm, that's why I'm sharing them. Here we go. Number two, love their mama. Dads, husbands, men, you want to parent your kids and, and set your kids on the right direction towards Christ and you want to you see them become all that God has for them, love their mother. Compliment her open the door for her, carry the groceries for her, set the standard of what love looks like in your home so that when your kids grow up, whether, whether you have sons or daughters, they will have an expectation of what, of what a godly man and a godly woman's love looks like. And so for me, I want Nora to see me love and honor, love, honor, and cherish Haley. I want, I want, I want her to see her dad, though I, I fail often and have to apologize often, I want her to see her dad love like Jesus as, as best as the Spirit of God and, and the grace of God empower me to do so that she will not settle for shallow pursuits when she's older. Selfishness. I want, her, I want when some idiot tries to treat, some idiot boy tries to treat her badly, I want her to, I want her to be like, you know what? I'm not interested. Because I've seen actually what love looks like. I've seen, I've seen the way my mom and dad love each other. I look forward, and I, I don't know, you know, like I said, I'm thinking big. I'm, I'm trying to survive the day too, but I, look, I, I can't help but kind of dream about the future and what it looks like. I, I hope by the grace of God I get to take Nora on daddy-daughter dates. That God allows me just to, just to live and grow old and just be her dad. And, and I hope that we'll get dressed up and we'll clean the truck up and we'll just go out and we'll, and, and, and we'll have a great time and I'll be able to set the standard for her. So when some guy shows up 
that she can tell the difference between somebody who loves her selflessly and, and versus looking at somebody who, who is trying to take from her selfishly, and they would say, ooh, that's terrible. That's not the way my daddy loves. Like, I, I, I hope to set the standard in my home of how of the love that she should expect because there, there will be, I pray, that God has in store for her a, 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 a future young man who will love, honor, and cherish her like Christ loves us. Now, I'm not trying to raise a prima donna, but I'm trying to raise, I want, I want to raise a mature young woman who can identify the difference between a boy and a man who will love her like Jesus. Husbands, you get to set the tone. You get to set the standard in how you love your wife. That will be, it's not always what you say. It's, it's, there will be a tangible, ongoing, habitual reminder of the love of God that they can look and say, no, there really is real love in this world that I can experience. I don't have to settle for less. So husbands, love your wives. Third, parents, prioritize your kids over money. Prioritize your kids over money. That the way, here's the way kids spell love. T-I-M-E. Time. And I, I, growing up, I grew up, and we didn't have a whole lot growing up, but we had just enough. And uh, y'all knew I grew up on C.H. Rankin Road. Okay, back before that, it was Millionaire's Row. And so I grew up on C.H. Rankin. We didn't have a whole lot. So, but, uh, but you know, just warning, warning a, a parent to come to a basketball game that I was playing in or something like that. Well, and, and, and the pushback I often got sometimes was, well, I, I, I don't have time to do that because I've got to work extra overtime because y'all want all this stuff. I, I, hear, I, hear, I hear parents say that to their kids sometimes. We'll be out and about, or I heard it when I was in youth ministry a lot more. Well, I, 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 can't, I can't be home. I can't do all these things because, I, because I've got to work all this overtime it's like, hey, listen, I bet if you took a vote in your household, your kids would say, you know what, we, don't, we could probably withstand having less junk so you'll be home more. If you took a vote, I bet that'd be the case. Especially dads with daughters. Especially dad with, dads with daughters. I know whew, my idea of a good time is one of two things, deer hunting and jujitsu, okay? And so I know that Nora's interests, her, her definition of a, of, a, of a fun time may not be jiu-jitsu or deer hunting, though I hope they are, and I'm praying hard for it right now. And, and I, I really am. I mean, I'm like, Lord, help me, please. And so, but I want her to know that her daddy valued her enough that I would love her and give my time to her, that she could paint my toenails and we could have tea parties too. You know what I mean? Like, I want her to know that, that, I, that I would be available for her. That she says, hey, like, hey, I, I, you know, will you, will you, or will you, you promise to be at my dance recital? Yeah, yeah, daddy will be there. Like, because how kids spell love is time. Hey, it's cool you got all, you get, it's cool you get all, all the gadgets and all the cool cars. That's awesome. Good for you. God bless you. But man, don't prioritize that over your kids. Because here's the truth. If you live to be 70, 70 years old, 75 years old, you have your kids in your household for 18 years. 18 years, that you have lived most of your life, you, or you have lived longer without your kids before and after you have them. If you have your kids at 20, 25 years old, you have them for 18, boom, empty nest again. I mean, so, so prioritize, prioritize the time for your children. I had a conversation one time. I've had countless conversations with youth when I was a youth pastor. So many stories I could share that just break your heart, but... Um, there was a troubled, there was a troubled kid at a local school here, and uh, he was acting out, going young boy, going crazy, you know, and saying a bunch of foolishness. And I pulled him aside one day, and I was talking to him, and I was like, "Hey, man, I was like, you know, what's really going on in your life? You know, his first, he's about 14 years old. You know, his response to me was, "I wish my dad was around more, and I wish I heard him tell me that he's proud of me." I've never heard my dad say he's proud of me. So, I, so he's like, so I just feel like what's the use? If my dad doesn't care whether I'm alive or I'm dead, then what does it matter? He's not here anyway. <clears throat> I 
You should be around your children and speak life to them and do fun things with them and invest them so they, so they have this, a strong foundation of, of, of your presence. It's not always going to Dollywood or going to Disney World, but, the, but your presence, your presence matters. Number four, finally, is again, dads, don't give up or give in. Whether if you're a stepdad, a biological dad, a divorced dad, a single parent. By the way, single parents, y'all are incredible. If you were a single parent, I cannot imagine having, ha, raising a baby for the last 10 and a half months by myself. Y'all are amazing. God's given you all kinds of crazy grace. Uh, so whatever the situation is, biological, stepdad, divorced dad, single parent, don't quit, don't give in. Fight for the hearts of your kids. Fight for the hearts of your little girls. And you may feel like sometimes you're fighting with them, but they're worth fighting for. Because the culture that they're growing up in would, would rather just have you settle for normal. But normal in our culture is broke, depressed, and alone. But Jesus said in John 10, 10, that I've come to bring you abundant life. So you can keep normal. I don't want to be normal, broke, depressed, and alone. You can keep that for you. I want the crazy abundant life that Jesus has in store for his people. Crazy abundant grace. Great joy and hope. And so that's what, parents, don't give in. Don't settle. Keep fighting for your kids. Keep fighting for the hearts of your children. They're worth, they're worth, they're worth having hard conversations with. They're worth nitpicking with sometimes over some things. You know, it, it, you have a hard conversation. Hey, you're 16, 17 years old. Sex is for married people because you're giving yourself away. You're giving yourself at the spiritual level soulfully away mutually to somebody who's giving themselves to you in the covenant of marriage, a commitment. That's the way God designed it. That conversation is worth having. Why? Because you're fighting for your kids. And so right now, your kids may not understand why you do what you do, but here's the reality. One day, they will understand, especially when they have their own kids. So right now, you're the, right now when they're little, you're the authority. When they get a little bit older, you're the interpreter. You're helping them make sense of God themselves in this world. And then eventually, as they get even more older, you become the God, the, the example the resource they can tap, the wise sage they can tap back into because when your kids are about, when they turn about 12, 13 years old, they think you're kind of dumb. And then they turn 25 again, and you know, when they turn 25, they go, oh man, he actually knew what he was talking about. Hey, hey what, what would you do in this situation? So keep fighting. Do not give up. Don't go, they won't listen to me. You just quit. Keep praying. Keep asking God. Do not quit. You can do it. Well, I don't feel like I'm very good at it. Great. Relationship is more important than skill. You don't have to be great at it. The Spirit of God is with you. God will guide you. God's given you the resource right here. God's given you a place here that you can keep going and not quit. So parents, there's all kinds of opportunity for you to leverage. Leverage the opportunities. And real quick, I want to speak to two more groups of people really fast. First is this, or the second group are, are brothers, the brothers, primarily single guys. Guys, if you're a taker and you're, and you're prowling around looking for women that you can take from, then that, that's, a, that's, a, that's an incredible sign of immaturity. That the Bible calls us to stand up and act like men because because. The, the ladies around you are your sisters in Christ. And you should be willing to lead, protect, and provide for one of them. And so, and so you should cherish and honor and love them. That's what it means to be a man. It's not about a, a bunch of macho bravado. Who cares? Fake tough guys everywhere. There, there are internet keyboard warriors everywhere. Wow, anybody can, anybody can try to talk and look tough, but real manhood is, is, is sacrificing yourself in love and, and, and to honor and cherish another person, primarily a lady. 
Because our church, as I hope every church around the world, would, would be a safe place that would honor, love, and cherish women from womb to tomb. So guys, let's value and let's treat as valuable our sisters in Christ. And lastly, this is to the ladies, especially the single ladies, the daughters here that would fall in this category. If you're a wall trying to do everything right, trying to, trying to trust the Lord, Jesus is faithful, keep being patient, God will provide for you because no man can satisfy your soul. Because you think a man will satisfy your soul and then you spend enough time with him and you'll go, ooh, really? Is there like a newer model that I can, try, I can trade in for? Right? But Jesus will satisfy your soul unlike anybody else. So run the race that God's marked out for you, and if, and if God puts in your path a Solomon, and, and, you, and you guys are running in the same direction towards Jesus Christ, and, 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 and you're in close proximity, then you can run over and run next to him. And maybe God, has, maybe God is lining something up there. But be patient. And if you're a door pursuing shallow relationships, You need to know that you're too valuable just to keep giving yourself away like that. You're too valuable to be a door. That a real man would commit himself to you and say, I do, and lay down his life for you. That's why sex is not for dating people. Sex is not for, well, we're going to get married people. It's for people who've already pledged their commitment to one another in the covenant of marriage because God pledged his undying commitment to us through Christ. That's how valuable you are, ladies. Don't sell yourself short. You are valuable to God. And there will be, there is a man who will value like that if you'll wait. So here's how I want to close this morning. Ben, can we come up? The good news is, is this. Whether you're a parent, a brother, or a daughter, the invitation is really all the same. The invitation is, is one word, and it's the word repent. That word repent means that word repent means to change direction. Here's the good news. You're like, man, I've not been the I've not been the parent God has called me to be. Hey, you could change the direction today. Then you're saying, well, my kids are my kids are older. They're out of the home. They're adults now. Hey, you can call them, and from this day forward, you can change the direction today. Oh, my kids are little, but I, we've not been pointing them to Jesus, and we're we're, we're really we're you know I've not been loving my spouse, and they've not been seeing that in my life, how you could change the direction today. The word repentance means turn around. That we confess it to God and we turn around. You can turn around. It doesn't matter how old you are, how old your, parents, or how old your kids are, you can turn around. If you're a single guy here, you can change the direction. Women are not commodities. They're gifts from the Lord to love, honor, and cherish. You can, you can change the direction, turn around if you've been thinking that way. To the ladies here, you're valuable. Don't sell yourself short. And if you have been, you can change the direction of the day by the grace of God. So no matter what stage of life you're in, no matter what, where you've been, what you're going through now, you can change the direction by the grace of Jesus Christ. Hey, if that tomb is empty, anything is possible. Change the direction.